would this have been your first BSDB meeting? No, actually not, because um, you know I did my postdoctoral training in London um, and also ran my lab in Edinburgh for a number of years before I moved back to Australia. So um, okay. the BSDB meetings are a staple feature of um, my research life cycle in the UK and something to be really excited to look forward to and actually quite inspiring as a postdoc in training and then to actually be given platform presentations as an independent group leader. And I was very excited to get the invitation because I hadn't been to the BSDB for a number of years uh, yeah. and delighted to be given uh, um, a talk on the podium and to tell uh, my colleagues and friends in the UK and abroad what I've been doing. So yeah, it was it was a quite of a little bit of a homecoming in some ways, if you yeah. like. So what, what what particularly about the BSDB meetings is it is it the fact that they give uh, younger researchers the chance to speak? Is it the broadness of them or? Yeah, I mean mainly because there's such a vibrant uh, developmental biology uh, community in the UK and mm -hmm. uh, such intellectual powerhouses and um, important players in the developmental biology sphere which, you know, grew out of British science in many ways. I mean, most of the major figures in, in um, development of biology, many of them came from the UK at, at mm. similar points in time. And so um, it's just a very high quality meeting with really good, young, talented scientists, um, you know, very vibrant community. And again, a lot of old friends I was hoping to catch up with, um, who don't yeah. train and all gone on to run their own labs and um, so I was super looking forward just to hooking back into that community a bit um, and catching up with people and seeing what they were doing so bloody coronavirus it was very disappointing um, and yeah. Uh, yeah and well we hope to catch them on the flip side of that absolutely yeah and and so what specifically would you have been talking about um, in your talk which actually I think would have been starting Round about now in the parallel yes. universe, yeah, well, Wednesday morning. Yeah. My wife was musing with me in the kitchen just before just before dinner. Says, "Oh well, boy, you made the right decision not to go to that meeting, didn't you?" And I was a little bit sanguine about that comment because you know, <laughs> I knew it was tonight that I was supposed to be talking, yeah. and I had this amazing schedule talked up to talk, to go to all my colleagues who I hadn't seen for ages and give talks and hang out with them and catch up with them. So yeah. It's sad, but no, our lab has been working in zebrafish for a number of years. That's what I trained in when I was in London. And we were interested in the development of biology and the regenerative capacity of skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. and, um, my lab has been interested in trying to work out uh, how the stem cell systems that are deployed during growth. So one of the big focuses of the lab is trying to understand how organs grow. So we know a lot about how they form initially, uh, even to the point now with organoid biology, we can make little replicas of them in the dish uh, based on the decades of tremendous development of biology that's gone on. And we know a lot about adult organs because we're endlessly fascinated in disease of our own organ systems and their homeostatic controls. But the understanding of in between how you grow a, a developmentally formed embryonic organ into its adult form is less well understood. Mm -hmm. And so for a number of years, my lab is very interested in using the very simple unicellular almost um, system of skeletal muscle to understand how it grows to scale and form. And so using the zebrafish model, which is optically transparent um, in its early larval phase and a bunch of um, lineage tracing technologies, we built a fairly careful understanding about how stem growth stem cell systems are used. and mm -hmm. then. Parallel, we were studying the regenerating system because skeletal muscle also can replenish itself after injury. And we described that there were two completely different stem cell systems in the muscle that still made muscle, but were regulated genetically in very distinct ways. So the talk was going to be comparing and contrasting organs for growth and the stem cell systems that are used for that and organs in repair, uh, where we had another stem cell system that I was going to compare and contrast and using the Zebrafish beautiful movies, we will we have beautiful movies from people in my lab that I get to present on their behalf. Yeah. Um, and genetics, which is the strength of the system, it would have been a, uh, a walk through in vivo biology of stem cell systems and growth and regeneration. Uh, sad we missed that. You know? <laughs> uh, 
Um, and and so is the is the live imaging the thing that's really getting you excited every day in the lab, or is it just the combination of genetics and live imaging? And well, I think. Live imaging is always what attracts me to the system. So understanding the in vivo cell biology of uh, stem cell systems and developmental systems is really what gets me up and out of the lab and hunting around people's desks for data every day. Mm -hmm. um, but now with the emergence of these incredibly powerful high throughput genomic tools and uh, single cell uh, trajectories and now combining lineage tracing with single cell analyses, it's given all developmental systems this real power at the single cell and single gene level description. So not only can we couple cell behaviors that are dynamically modeled, we can understand every gene all the time that's going mm -hmm. on in those systems. And then the ultimate goal, I think, is to study for, I think, for the regeneration part of it is to understand in the cellular constituents by imaging and exactly the shifts, molecular shifts they make to get to those particular cellular states. So mm -hmm. I call side of the lab the in toto wound repair model system. Mm -hmm. So um, which is kind of the holy grail now to describe every cell all the time with every gene. And, yeah. um, and that's sort of the, the way we want to do it. And the imaging has a large part to pay, play with that because mm -hmm. uh, what's missing from the equation of the, of the modern technological breakthroughs is understanding the dynamics of systems and living cells. Mm. Um, and that um, is something that the imaging brings to it very readily. But mm. yeah, that's the, the genetics and the imaging and the genetics are evolving so rapidly. Yeah. And also, I was going to make a point in the talk about technologically how uh, even in the few years since we've described some of our systems, the hardware for taking imaging uh, um, and the resolution that we're able to achieve by in vivo imaging, I was going to contrast it with a series of movies that have been taken on different platforms over that time. Yeah. And now we have this incredible um, you know, instrumentation breakthroughs like lattice light sheet, like area scanner technologies that have completely revolutionized the way that we collect data and the quality of the data we collect. Mm. So. It's just a brilliant time to be alive and be a biologist, actually, because um, yeah. just so much technology that's shifting so rapidly that's letting us answer questions in so many different ways. Uh, I think it's the most sort of fundamentally um, uh, ground shifting, you know, I'll use a, you know, being on the circle, which was the Australian analogy. This is the biggest wave I've ridden, I think, in my career in technology. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that is really um, Got, got me super excited about the horizons that are expanding. Uh -huh. I think we did things fairly similarly for, you know, maybe 15, 20 years almost. You know, it, of course there are shifts, but this is a monumental shift with CRISPR, yeah. with uh, single cell, um, with, you know, with the technology of the imaging all coalescing um, to change our field completely. Yeah, and I, and I guess that makes the, um, the science shutdown across the world all the more painful, I guess. And so my next question was, what's going on in your lab and in your institute with coronavirus at the moment? Yes, well, I think I, before we went on live, I was telling you as director, I was running around with my um, tape measure, trying to keep it but one and a half metres apart from each other. I felt <laughs> like, it was like, you know, that at old time dance hall where I was trying to, you know, make sure that the couples weren't, you know, dancing too close with one another. <laughs> that seems to be my main role at the moment, because I'm uh, I'm just desperately keen to keep everybody safe. And yeah. the cycle in Australia is in, a, is in a strange position. We're in the sort of eye of the storm, or not even that, we're in the, the calm before the storm, that everybody knows what's coming because they can see it all unroll. It's, China was a bit removed and abstract, but when you guys mm -hmm. went down, it was like, well, holy, this is going to happen to us. There's no way it can't. And so what we're watching with Europe is our destiny unfolding. Um, mm. We're behind you. So that is actually quite unsettling for the staff. And that's, I think, fueled a lot of the panic buying and things like that has happened. Everyone can see Italy shut down. Everyone can see the UK going, you know, going the same way. Mm. And so everyone is just very on edge. So scientifically, people know this horizon is coming and they know at some point they won't be in the labs anymore. 
Mm. So they are slightly panicked about, you know, if you're a PhD student in your third year, you're stuffed. You know, you're looking at three, four months out of the lab minimum. And so, and then those postdocs that are, you know, we've got some big papers, we've got a journals that we're trying to get the last sets of data over the line to resubmit it. The journals aren't going to care whether we've got coronavirus or not. So, you know, their careers are hanging literally with a roll of the dice of who they run into, who happens to enter into the institute at what time. Mm -hmm. So there's a Russian roulette going on in the lab. So at the moment we're working and try to make the, um, the social distancing uh, rules that have been mandated by government and by the university work um, while maintaining our training mission in our graduate program while trying to keep you know everyone hosed down so they don't go into meltdown and yeah. keep science the critical science uh, going on while at the same time i'm running a program of, of um, crisis management you know if such and such a person isn't there how are we going to do this yeah um, running project management and and um crisis management so it's for me i'm finding it the most bizarre time i've ever had as a scientist because the I science say, is, is this well, what you... very exciting, but I'm looking at Armageddon, you know. So it's yeah. it's, it's trying, and then having like all all people having to keep a calm face about it when, of course, you have no, you don't have any of the answers. Yeah. And what all people want is certainty and assurance, but there's none to be had. So, no. and then that's across everything and every face of public life or professional life in Europe now as well. Nobody knows how long it's going to last. When people are going to go back to work. Yeah. You, know, you told me it's weird being in your, at home for the first time. I'm sure it's going to be socially isolating as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the bizarrest thing imaginable. Um, yeah. oh, my hands shrunk to half their size with the amount of hand sanitizer I've used. <laughs> I actually had to stop and think the other day I was driving home that whether I was fit to drive or not, whether I could absorb that much alcohol through my bloodstream <laughs> or hand sanitizer. So there's some very bizarre things that creep into your head because yeah. we've been completely off our normal uh, rhythms yeah but they're trying to keep the scientists you know, the facilities going as long as possible mm. so they can at least future proof their projects for you guys it happened so suddenly i can't imagine you know so i was talking to some colleagues in france who said literally they were told the night before the university yeah. was closing so they couldn't even get their notebooks or any of the data or anything yeah. or or freeze down lines or their cells yeah. or anything. They just were not allowed back in the institute anymore. And yeah. that we're just trying to make sure that doesn't happen. That doesn't, yeah. yeah so I, I mean, particularly, yeah, with with model organisms, what do you do with your fly stocks or your your mice or your cell? I mean, yeah, it's it's exactly right. So I've been trying to tell them, don't start anything too critical or too long or complicated. Yeah. Um, Make sure all your stocks are frozen down so that when you come back, um, we can revive them. Um, mm. Set up crosses for the ones where you don't have the right uh, genetics yet for the long future haul. Yeah. So everyone's in this rather bizarre holding pattern waiting yeah. for doom to descend. <laughs> it's kind of, I don't know, it's a lot of black Australian black humour that's kicking in. Yeah, there's a fair yeah. bit of that here as well. Yeah. In the UK too, so... But yeah, I was just trying to, um, as a scientist and a leader, um, I'm just trying to keep everybody on an even keel and yeah. just trying to contingency plan for the things that may or may not happen. Yeah. Well, we wish you the best of luck. And yeah. uh, like you say, you know, see you on the flip side of this. And thanks a lot for talking to us today. Over again soon. And to all my colleagues in the UK, I'm thinking yeah. of you all. And um I'll have a beer quietly when I get when I get um, put into quarantine. I'll I'll make sure that I have beer fridge stocked, and I'll have one for my UK colleagues. Fantastic. Okay, mate. Well, great to speak to you, and good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll catch you later.